Hello and welcome to Season 3 of The Push Podcast. My name is Jack Ferguson, an experienced marketing and sales consultant with a science background, and I'm your host. This season of the podcast is essential listening for small and medium-sized companies looking for their next stage of growth. Myself and other experts will explore common problems in marketing, product, and sales. We will deconstruct them and then detail straightforward, evidence-based remedies for you. I aim to give you both inspiration and practical solutions to push through similar challenges in your own company. Thanks for being here and don't forget to subscribe on whatever platform you're listening on. Hello and welcome to episode 8 of the Push Podcast. This episode is all about marketing budgets for startups. With so much chaos, where should we even invest? To talk through this challenge, we do so through telling the story of fictional company writer who are an AI consulting startup. We have looked at problems they've had in episodes 2, 4 and 6 and now we are looking at their issues in episode 8. Writer's founder and main character of this journey, Jordan, has now seen success in converting five of ten free users to paid. He has now been advised by his board to build out a marketing budget and plan for next financial year to scale this success further and faster. But where should Jordan begin? Some of the specifics this episode will cover include the best place to start, how to reverse engineer a lead generation strategy and desired number of leads, the significance of data-driven decision-making, pinpointing effective channels and messaging through growth testing, the crucial role of hiring skilled personnel, but only at the right time, the importance of considering customer success and retention in budget planning, and much more. This episode was co-hosted by myself and product marketing specialist, Alex Urquhart. Let's bring in Alex. Hi, Alex. Good to see you again. Jack, great to be back. Great to great to be here with you, as always. I'd, I'd like to talk through a challenge that writer is having if you're prepared to talk about it with Absolutely. me. Absolutely. I'll always give it a red hot crack. You know, <laughs> you know me. I do. I do. <laughs> uh, so Jordan has converted five of the 10 free customers. So mm-hmm. the writer is, has been on a journey. They started with 10 users mm-hmm. and now they have five customers paying. So... Well done. That's a yeah. good conversion rate. Well done, I will Jordan. say that. Yep. Free good minute uh, converted. It's good. Yeah. 50%. <laughs> so happy for you, Jordan. But he's been advised by his mentors and board now to build out a marketing budget and plan for the next financial year. Okay. So how should he approach this? Okay. All right. Uh, and is there an investment? So assuming they're going to get some form of, yep, can come, let's, come through. Let's assume that. Okay. Yes. So the, 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 the investors are bored. Okay, cool. Again, everyone loves how if uh, you've heard any of the other episodes, I always start with it depends because it does. It depends what, what um, the budget really is. So looking back on that scenario there, you've got, so five of the 10 have been have been converted, which first and foremost, I think is a brilliant win. You got 50% conversion rate. I'd be interested in those other five. Those other five are still using the platform in some way. Are they being stubborn? Is it not the right time? Could there be customers later? But nevertheless, five paying customers, you've validated to an extent your go-to-market. You've got customers who hypothesize and it works and they're, they're using what you've got. So great. I think when it comes to doing the budget, it varies each sort of stage of the company, I think. But in the beginning, if you've got someone like writer and writer and and uh, I can't stop saying that way ever since we said it, um, the way Jordan uh, at the level he's at, I, I'm really cautious around budgeting. But I do appreciate. I know we spoke about this. You have to have something. You can't mm-hmm. go to investors and boards and go, oh, we're going to give it a red hot crack and just give us some cash and we'll figure it out. Like that's not going to fly. So you've got to have something on paper. The problem is, you also need something to ask for. Like you yes. need you need a principle to ask for from the investor yeah. and the earlier you are in your journey there is so many more assumptions like the further you go down if you're looking at companies like canva or microsoft or whatever they probably have pretty hard numbers of like you know how much they spend on paid ads how much they spend on events and what they get out of the events and they can almost dial it up and down and go great we want to make more money out of events because that's better for new products so we're going to ramp that up we're going to triple the amount of events we do next year um, that makes total sense and there's far far less risk but When I say early stage, I don't even mean one or two customers or before you go to market. I'm talking like up to dozens of customers and 50 people. Like there's there's people I know who have got a team of 85 people with thousands of um, maybe seven or eight million a year in ARR and they still call themselves a startup because they're still trying to find out there. So I think, Go back to the first question. So looking at the budget for next year, I would go through and first and foremost document everything that you already know. 
So we spoke, I think, last episode or the episode before, maybe number six or, or, or number four about you've got to document everything you find out. So data is super important to begin with. So where, where are your customers coming from? What's the effort to acquire them? Um, how many meetings do you have? What's the what's the um, sales cycle? And the sales cycle is, but let's just say you sort of meet them, you inquire, you uh, reach out to them all the way till they sign the contract and they're sort of paying for it. So looking at all, all those ones there, so what channel? So how are you finding them? When you find them, how long does it take to convert them? And what is the conversion rate to, to converting them? So if I look at that, I'll just list out a few sort of basics here, right? So you've got CAC, cost of acquisition, sort of, and that's saying um, how much it's going to cost you to find to bring on a new customer. CAC also goes pretty in line with the sales cycle and timing wise, because it's not just like, oh, cool, if it costs $500 a customer, then I'll give you three grand and just give me six customers. Mm. Like that could take 12 months mm-hmm. for that to work. So you've got cost of acquisition. And again, it varies too. So I've, I've worked at companies where their cost of acquisition is the hourly rate of the sales team, the hourly rate of the marketing team, the the tools that it costs, the overheads, plus paid ads or subscriptions or whatever they're sort of paying for. Where I've had other companies, particularly earlier on, they go, what's the total running cost? Like developers, product designers, everything. What's the total cost of everything? And um, how much, how, how many new customers we bring on each month? So if it's costing us, 20 grand a month to run the company, bring on five new customers a month, four grand a customer. Mm. So it's very sort of um, straightforward. As you said before, there, to me, there's no perfect science to this at, at all, but I think do whatever you think is best representative. So um, particularly when it comes to, as you said, you, you've got to give something to the board or to the investors. Whatever you give them, you're just going to have to stand by it and go, And because they'll, they'll ask you questions guaranteed. They'll be like, well, why is that so, so high? Why isn't that smaller? And how can we finish the? And is, if you're like, oh, I don't know, I just made it up, then you're probably going to have a bad relationship with your investors. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So, I think I think having that there, I think having your assumptions down first and, f- first and foremost, any data you can, anything like the cost of acquisition, there's return on ad spend is another one. See, that varies if you've even done ad spend. So, have you run mm. pr- uh, print ads? Have you run digital ads? Have you run anything else? Mm-hmm. And if so, how much do you spend and what do you get out of it? Yep. For this one here, like for example, worked with or consulted to a company who had their their return on ad spend was this really huge number and it's because they tried ads a little while back and got like one lead that never really converted. And I was like, well, that's sort of irrelevant, really. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't, I'd just scratch it out and say, mm-hmm. tempted is qualitative data, but we don't have really have a, a return on ad spend. Breaking down the CAC, there's cost of lead as well. So especially for SaaS, like I think understanding your cost per lead because in the beginning, your cost per lead is going to be quite high. So like just finding someone who's, and when I say lead, like sales qualified lead because there's two, um, I'm jumping around a bit, but there's marketing qualified lead who's someone who's like, hey, I'm interested to talk to you, but they could be like your mum's friend who's just curious to see what you're doing as opposed to a sales qualified lead is someone who's the right person, the right target, the right buyer, the right problem. So there's someone who could use your thing, but for whatever reason, timing wise, they're busy budgets, they may not go ahead. So you need to know how, what, what your lead is. So start at the top of the funnel. So what's the cost per lead? What's the success rate of your lead or the conversion rate? So if it takes one in four, which is quite good, but one in four leads to convert, then your cost per acquisition may, may be four times your cost per lead. So mm-hmm. so I think understanding your fundamentals first and then going, okay, um, I think there is a rule of thumb, I think we were saying the other day, like 30% I've heard before of your invest- investment or your budget should be done towards marketing. Again, I think that makes sense for a defined company where you know your channels, you know where the leads come from, you know how the effort it takes to get them there. For Jordan, he's still figuring out his messaging, he's still figuring out his his channels, he's still figuring out everything else. So having something on paper, yes, he needs to write down, currently we do conferences and road trips with our sales team. Given it is a business to enterprise product, I would say most of your leads and sales are going to be coming from direct one to one, direct one one to one to the sales guy or the sales person there, because it is a complex sales. So, so maybe even that ad, that marketing spend or that spend could be on hiring a new marketer or a new salesperson to really go to really go after that. So, I would say for the budgeting, figure out well, where do we think the leads and the sales are going to be coming from. Then write down okay, to date it's cost one salesperson and say fifty grand worth of budget, and that's got us five customers. Mm-hmm good assumption. Now we want to get to 50 customers. If we 10x that, is that insane? And that's when all the assumptions sort of come out because you'll go, oh, well, by the we get to the 12th customer, we'll get our messaging and the speed will be better and, the, mm. and we'll move faster. So it'll be a bit cheaper as we go. So having that, that there and extrapolating out, all right, so it's cost, it's it's one in four leads. The leads cost us 300 bucks a pop. So one in four means $1,200 per lead, which then means if we're selling uh, writer, let's just say $500 a month. So $500 a month, $1,200 to get the sale. 
then it's probably a two month or three month return on investment. So which I believe the payback period for um, SaaS. So there's all these numbers that the investors, they'll want metrics mm. and they want to be like, okay, paint the picture for me. How do we do it? You've got to be able to um, have a, hopefully have a good relationship with your board and your investors. And I've seen people with both good and bad relationships because sometimes board members aren't from the industry that you're in. Like they're quite good executives, mm. but they won't be like, I've worked in SaaS companies where not one board member knew SaaS. <laughs> You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's not a bad, like I get it. They know how to run companies, but like the, in their mind, it was like, what's the cost per acquisition? Mm. What's the spend on ads? What's the spend on this? And what's the, what's the inventory? You know, it's like mm. all these other things that they're sort of used to and not knowing that in the beginning, there are so many assumptions. And then also too, your cost of acquisition in the early days is going to be huge. Mm. And I'll, I can say that without a doubt, unless yes. you're a unicorn, freakish, you know, amazing product. Because when it comes to SaaS companies, there is a huge fixed cost and a low variable cost. And what I mean by that is to build a product and service, say five of these customers takes probably that team you got there. If they were to bring on another five customers, probably nothing changes. You probably get a little bit more support time and the developers maybe have to fix a couple more things. But compared to say a restaurant, if you have 50 customers a night and then you have 100 customers a night, you're gonna have to build the kitchen out, hire new staff, you know, get new seating. It's the variable cost is way higher for say brick and mortar or something else. But when it comes to SaaS, investors love SaaS mm. because you can have a, a fixed cost of what it takes to build a small team. And if you've got a really good product, particularly it's self-serve it can potentially be a multiplier of 50x or 100x so you can have all these customers with very little cost mm -hmm. so in the beginning your first couple of customers by definition are going to cost a lot for their acquisition but you think about something like microsoft or canva or adobe they'd be converting customers worth 20 grand right now over a single phone call mm -hmm. And it's like, well, that phone call cost me 50 bucks and we yep. made, you know, so the cost of acquisitions, yep. amazing. Mm -hmm. But in the early days, it's probably three people working around the clock plus a product team, plus experimenting, plus, you know, all this work. So I think making sure that your board and your investors understand the reality. And if they're just going to go off, give me a number, and I'm going to hold you to it you're going to be in so much trouble mm -hmm. because it's not, it's not going to be reflective of reality. Everyone I've ever seen who's built a budget or built these numbers out and gone like, okay, what's the forecasting has always been wrong. I've never, ever, ever seen a forecast. <laughs> I've never seen a budget. I've never seen anything that has ever gone according to plan. I can I can validate that too. Have yeah. you? Okay, yeah. good, good. It's, a, <laughs> it's But you have to do it still. You yes. have to, if you're presenting something to investors, you have to go, here's a number I want. Yep. Here is how where I'm going to spend it. Yep. I want to know if I'm understanding this correctly, you think CAC is an important number to mm -hmm. present to investors, mm -hmm. cost per lead, important number, ROAS, you might need to talk them out of at this stage. And if they want it, if they want that, you're going to have to say, maybe not. It's not important at the moment. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just not. Or we can find the data and come back to you. Yeah. yeah. We all, we, you've got, yeah. Um, you might not have spent much money on mm -hmm. ads. So, mm -hmm. Um, or it might not have contributed. It might be hard to measure, blah, mm. blah, blah. How would you measure CAC here? Because one of the issues I've seen with it over time is that there's so many different ways, as you were saying before, what you can factor into that measurement. Mm, mm. What would you factor in? I would I would originally, just before I presented to sort of anyone, I would have probably three different ways. I would have one of total cost and total output. So like everything of all the people, all the running costs, because you could technically say, you know, a lead comes through by word of mouth from an existing customer. You couldn't really attribute that to the salesperson or the marketer. So I'd look at the bigger picture and go total cost and total output. By that definition, that's going to be the highest, sorry, the worst cost. Like it's going to be extremely high. I would then look at segmenting that out just in terms of the marketing and sales attribution. And when I say attribution, obviously things that are attributed to getting that outcome. So what's the cost of the salesperson? And I've had ones where it's like the salesperson is part marketing or like part office manager admin and part sales. So it's like, yeah, okay, cool. Half their time is in, in sales. Great. What's their total cost to have this person on my team for half the time? For this sake, for Jordan, I would say the marketing person, obviously for the salesperson and for any additional sales and marketing costs. So your CRM, potentially, your any ad spend, your events that you've gone to, the branding stuff. So anything that relates on front of market that's needed to find, attract and convert customers. And I would do your best to summarize that because again, no perfect answer, but um, if you're in a court of law if in, or in front of your investors and board, as long as you can justify why you've done it. So they go, oh, how would you get that number? And you go, well, here, here's, here's all, the, all the numbers I found. These are all the costs I added together. And I would do that. And then I would maybe as a third one and I'd go down and go, what is the exact like exact number? So if the salesperson went to two events 
they found five leads and converted two of them. You could say the attribution of those two customers is purely from the two events they went to. So what were the costs of the two events? And what was the cost of this person's time? And you could see that that level of scale I'm talking through is, is sort of like super broad incorporating every piece of attribution all the way down to what's directly attributed. Mm. So indirect versus direct. Looking at those three numbers, again, depending on your relationship, you've got a good relationship with your board, maybe talk through your board about this stuff or if you've got a relationship with your in- investors. But obviously you want to choose something that you can, that you will stand by. And yeah. the first one's going to be the highest, the, the, the end one's going to be the lowest. If the worst case scenario, the top is good, then lead with that because it sort of tells a good story. It's like, hey, everything considered, all these costs and time and effort, the cost is not that bad. Um, but because particularly for B2B attribution, and I've spoken with experts here like who are just so good at it, even they are like, they're so hard, we don't know. Some people bought a million dollar software because their mate's cousin at the pub said they really recommended it at this thing and they're like, I recommend you go after it. And there's marketing people who are like, great, we spend all this money on ads, that's because of us, they came on yep. board. And it's like, well... It's actually because of everyone, the product, the people, yep. the, the whole point. So That did all that work to make that person in the pub happy with you that, that they told someone else to buy from you. Correct, yeah. correct. And word of mouth is the most powerful, but the least thing you can least control. Yes. So, yeah. So, yeah, I, I think doing those ones there and finding um, those cost of acquisitions. And it's probably that middle one, like I said. Like if you had to segment it out and go, well, the, I hired a sales guy for new sales. I've hired a marketing person for new leads. And I've bought all this software and spent money on stuff for, to, get new, to, get, to get new customers. Because then the next question is, if the board, because they're never going to be happy in the first sense, they're going to be like, can we make it cheaper and can we find more 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 customers, which is which is their job? Then you need to say like, okay, well, we can't fire the salesperson. That's mm-hmm. not it's okay. We can't give them a sal- uh, salary reduction. The marketing person, we can't do that either. But let's just say, hey, we went to five events last year. Three of them we didn't get anything from. So let's cut back the spend on that. Then all of a sudden your cost of acquisition goes down. Mm-hmm. Um, well, at least theoretically it goes down. Yep. So... And then, but or you, or you can say, hey, the cost of acquisition is not too bad. I want to risk um, increasing it, so I want to spend more money on events or spend more money on um, webinars or whatever that is to try and br- to try, try and bring them in. Because particularly for enterprise, this enterprise, uh, sorry, this enterprise software is not too bad. But when you look at really high, I, w- I worked for a company for a while that had huge ticket items that it was like cost of acquisition was astronomical, and then they signed a, con- a new customer, and it was like. The cost of acquisition is great. It's mm. so low. And it's mm. like like you've had one customer who's just changed the average so mm-hmm. low. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I think it's super subjective. But so long as your numbers tell a story that you can stand by is probably my point. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, that's point a few, few ways someone could, could measure it. Mm. I hear about the cost per acquisition to LTV ratio at times as well. Mm-hmm. So... Uh, which is something I've always been quite skeptical of because then it de- it depends on how you measure your acquisition costs. Mm-hmm. Would you present something like that to a board? Yeah, I, again, I think I think to your point before, like they need something, and I think even mm-hmm. if I take another big step back for this whole episode, right? And I think everything we're talking about, what the board and what the investors want to understand is the picture of how good your company's going at the moment and 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 what the logistics are. So. I think all these numbers just tell a story. Mm. And I think if you can put your best foot forward and justify the story and then show, mm-hmm. them the, show them the numbers and explain it, that's the best you can do. If you've got investors and you've got board members who hold you knife to the throat on the exact numbers that you have and, and get really angry when you, do, when you deviate, that's not, that's not good for anyone. And mm. I, would, like, I don't think you can get rid of them, but like try to manage that. But I, I would say, yeah, like ha- having that there, so, so uh, your, your um, to- total lifetime value and your cost of acquisition, which in a smaller sense is how much does it cost for us to bring on a new customer and what's the what's the value that's worth to us? Mm-hmm. So again, in the beginning, like someone goes, oh, what's the lifetime value of this customer? And if you've only been gone for 18 months, yeah. it, you can say infinite, it's subscription, <laughs> right? They're going to pay us infinitely for, for, for forever. Yeah. But there is particularly for B2B, there is standards out there that talk about, you know, th- um, the monthly value over three years to five years in certain cases, depending on what it is, but it's more like three years now because the market is so, the competition is so high and people switching costs is becoming easier. So I would say conservatively look at three years that if someone buys writer and you do a good job and they don't churn, they should stick around for three years, hopefully much longer. Mm-hmm. But let's just say three years. So for writer in this case, $500 a month for three years. Let me do some math on that. It's like 30 grand. No. Sorry, say it again. Uh, 500 bucks a month. So that's sixty grand a year. Sorry, yeah, six grand a year. 
Yep. Sorry, six grand a year. So sorry, yep. yes, yes, yes. Over over three years, so eighteen thousand. God, yep. my math's terrible. That's awful. Um, so eight, eighteen thousand dollars is yep. that lifetime value of that customer. Mm-hmm. Like as you said, that person could churn after four months. We don't know yet, but at least you can say, hey, if they stick on, the assumption is we want to keep people for three years. We should be able to keep them for three years. So five hundred dollars a month. Each customer we acquire is worth eighteen thousand dollars. So when you think of it like that, spending two grand yep. on a new customer is cheap yes because you've got a what's that nine to one ratio Mm -hmm. and then if you look Mm -hmm. at the payback period so they they pay you 500 bucks a month it costs uh it costs um two grand to get them on there so in four months time you made your money back so it's it's sort of profitable again very subjective because even there's the cost cost of acquiring and cost of retaining as well because you've got like the customer success team and it gets complicated. So I think looking at that there and saying, getting your LTV, and it's just a good metric because again, the investors just want to know a ballpark and go, mm. you know, if you're making margins at 2% and it's taking you two years to convert each person, if, if I'm an investor, unless you're going to somehow justify that, like I'd be like, oh, that's awful. Mm. Like I, I, no right, no founder in their right mind would ever project those metrics, even though they might be true. But they'll say like, hey, it takes us between three to six months to convert a person. The total lifetime value is 18 grand, costs us two grand to acquire them, payback period of four months. At least then the investor can the back of a nap can go like, okay, yep. awesome, great. If you can get 100 customers, um, I'm, then I'm in the green. Sure. Yeah, so in the next two years, you need to get 100 customers and I'll mm. give you $500,000 or a million yeah. bucks. Yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. So I've got a question then on vetting the investors because it sounds like you're saying that if they do want to hold you – really strictly to the budgets you're presenting mm. that that's not the appropriate investor for this time in the in the journey it's not the most ideal again sometimes beggars can't be choosers and it's like <laughs> you know you've got a and and no, the, like investors aren't going to be your best friend like it's not going to be anything like that it's the same as customers right you can have bad customers you can have good customers at the end of the day they're customers and you're going to have to serve them they're going to have issues with certain things but you're going to have understandable customers and you're going to have just time wasting ba- mm. value bandits as they call it like people that will you know get angry at every little step i've heard some horror stories from investors same as customers as well um of people who give very little ask for a lot change the goal posts very cutthroat mm. and they sort of go fire these three people because mm-hmm. i you know i want to i want to have cash flow positive <laughs> because on their side of things you've got to appreciate that they, they can't just throw money away if they're going to give you a million dollars you want to be like I want to return, mate. Like, yeah. hurry up. But having spoken to some of these investors too, like they'll say, hey, we have this company invests in 60 companies, right? We know they'll say like 50% of them will do average, if not lose money. A 5% will do really well. We'll make, mo- we'll, we'll make most of our return. So it's a bit of a numbers game. So in their eyes, they're trying to get the return on their investments. But to you as one of those customers, you're sort of being farmed at, mm-hmm. the, at the same point. And that's, that should be a negative thing, but you need to give that person a return if they don't see a return, they're not going to like you very much or not going to give you a lot, of, a lot of attention. So same as customers in the beginning, I think it's all about one, um, I wouldn't say shopping around, but just get to know yep. people too. So if you're speaking to investors, understanding um, who they are, if they're mm-hmm. people for, in this case, if this is a, a software for lawyers, you know, having a board member or an investor that understands that market, that appreciates software, that gets the journey, uh, that's a green flag. People who, when you give them your assumptions and you give them your concerns, they go, yeah, that that, and they're comfortable with them. It's again, same as a customer. If you set expectations with the customer and go, this is going to take six months, may blow out by twenty percent. I'm not sure, and they go, yeah, that's all understandable. Good. If you have a customer that off the first meeting they're asking for discounts, you know that's going to end badly. Mm-hmm. So, I think just make sure you when you're vetting in anything, partners, investors, board members, customers, whoever, employees. If you don't set the right expectations in the beginning long term they're just it can get really really bad because because mm-hmm. so, like sometimes i've worked with customers that they need like a rain hail or shine you can have steve jobs himself can come back in and try and do this it'll take two to three years to get this thing off the ground mm-hmm. and if sometimes investors don't see that picture and they don't want to see that that mm-hmm. picture because they're like i'm giving you a million a year i don't want to give you more money mm-hmm. figure out a way to make this thing profitable mm-hmm. in 12 months or i'm out mm-hmm. so sometimes yeah unfortunately founders have to stand up and say oh yeah we yeah we yeah we can make that happen yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh yeah i'll spend 30 grand and we'll get a cash of this and a um, return on investment of this and yeah. again very rarely does it happen that way <laughs> alright awesome well I want to finish off with this then Jordan does need to go with a number mm. to ask for he needs to ask for a certain amount of money and he needs to ask for a certain amount of money within that to be available to put towards the marketing budget Yep. if let's say for argument's sake 
I'm going to say that the right is $500 a month mm -hmm. at the moment. They've sold five customers on it. Great. Mm -hmm. Let's say that their cost per lead is 200 bucks. Mm -hmm. Let's say that the cost per acquisition is 800 bucks. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to then go about what should the marketing budget be from mm -hmm. these numbers mm -hmm. and what should the overall ask of investment be? That's a great question. Um, I would say so. If I was in Jordan's shoes with the, with those there, I would work from the um, the goal or the 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 end, the end backwards, and I'd go. I'd, I'd try to to reverse engineer that process and go. Those numbers are good from a starting point. Now, what do you want to get to? Do you think if you want to get to say, um, and I'm going to start throwing numbers out, but you, you go, okay, I want to get to monthly recurring revenue. So your MRR subscriptions, they're currently at two uh, two thousand five hundred dollars, right? I want to get to in twelve months. I want that to be say fifty thousand dollars a month so which is what 20 times that yes so 20 times the customers and i go okay if it's 20 times the customers and you said a um a cac of uh eight hundred dollars of eight hundred dollars so if so then if if we go 800 by 20 mm -hmm. sorry 800, 800 by how many more customers is that that is that going to be so Just um, five, so forty-five more customers, for, for forty-five times eight <laughs> is going to be a lot. So I think looking at like how many, what goal do you want to get to, and then break that down to go, okay, how many, how many sales, does, how many sales does that mean? And if that means forty-five new sales, well, then how many leads does that mean? Or well, that means well, we say four x, one in four, mm -hmm. was that the one? Yep. So one in four, so four times that, which would be uh, hundred and eighty leads that I'd have to find, those sales qualified leads, then I'd break down that point to the marketing and sales spend and go, cool. Well, if we need 180 leads and say a sales time of um, six months, mm -hmm. so, and if we look at, so I'm jumping around a bit, I'm just paint, just trying to paint a picture and say it's January, by December, we want these results. It takes six months for each sale. So therefore you need to get your leads in the first six months. So you, a lead you find in June will close in December. Mm -hmm. So between now and July, I want, I need 180 leads in order to get to 45 paying customers. The current cost per lead is $200 a lead. Uh, yes. So, so $200 a lead. So $200 times that is, that's again, another massive number as well. So 360, um, so $36,000-ish sort of give or take. So I'd look at that and go, that's exact science to it. I'd add a buffer to that. And I'm making this up as I go. I'd want more time than two minutes to do yep. this budget. But I'd say with that 36,000, let's just push it out and say there's some additional um, experimenting and trials and errors and things that'll, that'll, that'll go wrong. So 50K. Mm -hmm. On that one there, we just using those numbers, I would say $50,000 based on upon the cost per lead, the cost per acquisition and the time to close. So, and I would look at that and then I would, again, on top of that, and I'd start listing in, in, in a room, ideally with the sales and marketing person, Knowing full well, the sales and marketing person will be like, no, 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 we need double that. Like mm. they're always going to say, I've never met a sales or marketing person that says we need less budget. Mm. They'll always want more. So $36,000, maybe push it to fifty, and then have some assumptions of saying, hey, we're going to run some tests on return on ad spend. So we said before, we're going to run some tests on a bunch of other things because their goal is it's currently $200 a lead, which is still quite good, but we want to get that down to 100 so we're going to try all these different things. We're going to experiment with overseas customers. We're going to try all these different areas. And there's going to be a buffering of 30, 40% of that budget to to achieve that. So in conclusion, I think using your CAC, your cost per lead, reverse engineering it from what goal do you want to hit by, mm. by, by what date. Mm -hmm. Again, forecasting will never be perfect. Mm -hmm. But you can use those numbers and reverse engineer your way back and go, I need 180 leads in the next six months. Yeah. And currently to date, all my leads have come from trade shows. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have to attend a crap load of trade yeah, yeah. <laughs> There may not even be enough trade shows there during yeah, that time. Yeah. So Which would cap yeah, you, the spend you can do as well. Yeah. Because yeah, if there's a finite amount of trade shows, well, we went to five and there's only another few we can go to. Correct. Uh, that caps that. And that's when that's when that qualitative thinking outside the box yep. uh, testing sort of comes in. And yep. you could even say that and go, we, we, we got every single – trade show so therefore um we're still only, we, need, we need to find another 90 leads somewhere else looking at other competitors we could do that via webinars or we could do that via um partnership arrangements you know here's three partners i'm going to partner with here's the cost i think it's going to do, do that so i think there's yeah there's and then with 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 those ones there so, so obviously under your trade shows you've, you, you've got data for some form of certainty you go each trade show we get this many leads Partnerships have no idea. Mm -hmm. Could cost twenty grand for one lead off a partner. Could mm -hmm. cost two dollars. We have no idea. So having that there, and then communicating that with the founders and saying, "This is my approach," because all they want to do 
is exactly what you want to do. You just want to have some some form of confidence to go, okay, I see how you got to that number and that makes sense. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm confident. Mm-hmm. Yep, yep. And that's and you've had a buffering there too. So 50 grand feels good to me. I'll, yep. throw, I'll, I'll throw 50 at it. If you can turn that into 50K MRR, which mm-hmm. is like a pretty quick return, mm-hmm. go for it. Here's 50K. Sure. You know what I mean? So I hope that made sense. It does, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, it's, it's interesting. What came to mind actually is with this stuff sometimes is – when you're asking for a certain amount of money to put into marketing or sales, you can sometimes think about it like if we don't ask for enough, there's an opportunity cost to that. Mm. So mm. like trying to get – so you, when you're talking about your goal there, like your goal being uh, – The goal was to get to 45 new customers. 45 new customers. But, you know, why not say 200 or 250, right? Like some of those – I think that's where it gets really tricky because mm. you want to spend – if you haven't spent enough and you were still going to get a return mm. on that extra spend, mm. you kind of did lose money. Yeah. I, used to, I remember saying to my uh, founder who used to work quite closely with, and I was like, hey, we're going to struggle. Right now, we don't have the data, the budget, or the time. Like everything that we know right now to hypothesize where we think we're going to be mm. is going to be so much less than what we think. And they're like, yeah, but we want we want double that. I said, well. Okay, well, let's put 10x that. Like, yeah, who, yeah. like let's put a million that. Like, yeah, it, does, yeah. it doesn't, it's it's so irrelevant. And, and anything could happen. Network effects can kick in and the market could change. All these things could happen. But I think the relevance is like picking something, and that goes back to what I was saying before, all your assumptions, are they justifiable? Mm. If you said, hey, we can hit, we can hit 2 million, we're, yeah, we're, we're at five paying customers. We can hit 5,000 paying customers in six months. Show, show mm. me how you got to that number. Mm-hmm. Can you explain to me how you think you're going to get that? Yep. And if they go, oh, we're currently getting two leads a week, but that means we're going to have to get 50 leads a day. Yep. I'd be like, okay, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> explain yeah. how you're going to do that. Yeah. Um, sometimes people, because it's not their forte, some board members and investors, but like that's the first question I ask is if you're going to double the amount of leads, then something upstream has to change. Mm-hmm. Are you hiring more people? Mm-hmm. Are you going to spend more mm-hmm. money? If you say to me, oh, the market could change between now and then, then you're gambling. Yep. You're hoping to God something changes in the universe and people come through the door as opposed to saying, yeah, those trade shows give us five customers. We're going to double the amount of trade shows and we're also going to add a speaking spot to all these trade shows. So that should double the amount of leads again from, from that. Then that's a justifiable answer. Yeah. And I, go, I see how you got that number. Mm. Yeah. It was making me think as you were saying this, like do you want to ask for enough money where you, you picture the point where you can handle it with roughly your current team structure or, or roughly um, without that, when you're talking about that upstream stuff, like before you need this radical change in, you know, hiring three people mm. and or mm. five people to be able to achieve it because mm. then you know, hiring costs and mm. we know that mm. slows companies down mm. and then you got to bring all these other people in. And so it got me thinking that would you ask up to a point – where we're trying to get to this point because we don't think that's going to be too disruptive to that point, to yep. our current structure. Once we get there, we know we're going to have to change structure and this type of thing. So mm-hmm, that's mm-hmm. why we're trying to get to this goal or mm. this milestone. Yep. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. I think to that question there, I think it's like, yeah, if, I, if, I'm, with a, if I'm with writer and I'm like, Ideally, I would rather not hire more people. If I can get the results with the people I have and just spend money on ads and trade shows, then that's that's the ideal state. Mm-hmm. Um, hopefully that my staff aren't dying and working 100-hour mm-hmm. weeks. One, I think it's, that becomes of what's the, what's the least risk to reward ratio. Mm-hmm. Um, I say hire more salespeople because just in this case, I've my experience at least and everything that I've learned and known over time, when it comes to large enterprise sales, and this isn't large enterprise, but it is enterprise to an extent, particularly in the beginning having their their complex sales and they're highly relate they're highly reliant on um relationship building so you know if you're a canva or if you're a mirror or if you're something that's like pay a credit card on the thing and where you go then hopefully not hopefully it's just like get your marketing team make sure they're they're sort of resourced make sure the product team support team the the and the sort of portal works well and we can handle the amount of people and then ramp up as many of those sign-ons as we can. And if it's like a product-led growth side of things where it's like, hey, once people do a free trial, they watch this video, there's an 80% chance they're going to convert, even better. Don't don't hire anyone else. Just get people through that funnel as fast as you can. But yeah, when it comes to these ones, it does take context and the confidence of the founder, but knowing what's going to work in your market. Because if you have... If you look at something like um, Salesforce now for those large companies and you're like, hey, we're going to double revenue next year by just throwing $3 million at Facebook ads. Mm-hmm. 
I don't know their data. That could happen. But I would imagine these large accounts, like if you're selling to BP Oil or if mm. you're selling to the Queensland, the Australian government, I doubt the Australian government's going to buy a $4 million contract over a Facebook ad. <laughs> like it, it might start it off, yeah. but it, it, sorry, it might start the conversation or it might yeah. just set the top of line brand awareness. That, that, that sort of stuff might uh, attribute to it. But I know in order for me to find five new big paying customers, I'm mm. going to have to shake their hands and be a yep. salesperson and get in front of them. Yep. So, yeah, ideally, least risk possible, the path of, of least resistance to get to that figure. Mm-hmm. But then to your point then, so, say you hit 50,000 and you're like, I'm not hiring anyone. We're just we're doing this lean. We're doing super lean, which is everyone's goal. But then you, if you forecast and you look in your mind, if I get to five, uh, 50 customers and you go, our support channels are going to be exhausted and our sales guys are going to be at maximum capacity. Well, then maybe preempting the following 12 months to that and go, is it smarter for me to bring in a salesperson now? Because mm. I know for this, for the, I can probably achieve this goal without them. But then if I do achieve it, which you're lucky to do so, you may be in a bigger problem afterwards. So I think preempting and going, what does the next three years look like? And what should my team look like to manage that? And mm. what's the product going to be? Are you going to pivot to a self-service credit card over the counter or are you going to keep it as a large enterprise sale sort of thing so i don't think there again I'm, I'm sorry i never give a straight answer to anything but i think i would look at that and go what people do you need ideally as least risky and complicated growth as possible mm-hmm. yeah amazing i think that covers a lot i uh yeah there's definitely some good metrics people can grab onto with that um thanks for uh painting the picture of how to kind of extrapolate that out and think of Think of the raise and think of how much money you might have. So I think I've told a million ways how not to write a marketing bu- marketing budgets, but hopefully you can <laughs> figure out a way to write one out of that. So uh, it was good fun. So <laughs> so thanks again for for being here, Alex. Awesome. Thanks, Evan, Jack. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Push Podcast. Please remember to subscribe, and if you are enjoying the episodes, please leave a review of the podcast on your platform of choice. It really helps to build the podcast credibility and to help others find this type of information.